three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Nine Hole Podcast. This is your host, Ian Miller. Today, I am joined by the new head coach of the Missouri State Bears baseball team. Joey Hawkins is with me today. Joey, how are you doing, man? Doing good, man. Fired up to be on the show. Obviously, a lot going on, a lot of change in our program, but uh, it's an exciting time. So looking forward to digging into some things with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to talk a little bit about your story, how you got to where you're at in the game of baseball, the upbringing, um, you know, maybe start with some of your playing career. Uh, you've obviously taken over at the helm of the Missouri State program. You are the third head coach in program history. Um, so there's going to be a new little facelift moving forward, man. A new era of baseball is starting at Missouri State. Would love to take you through the background, obviously, ask you some questions about that. Talk to you about the current team that you are now taking over and, and leading moving forward. Um, talk about the outlook, um, how, how we think that, you know, the program's going to stack up this year at the, at the first year at the Hellman. And then end with some advice to the next generation. Obviously, um, you know, the hope is that a lot of players uh, that want to play at the next level, the Division One level, maybe your program can see what you guys are, what you guys are doing at your program uh, in your locker room, man. Uh, maybe they may... Uh, you know, they relate to some of the ideologies that you guys are talking about, that you're preaching, that you're teaching. And, man, maybe we create some buzz, man. If that sounds cool with you, I'd love to run you through the gauntlet. Let's go. Let's do it. Ready Let's to rock. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, obviously, like I said, man, you are the third head coach in program history. Man, if you could maybe take me through some of the background. Obviously, you played at Missouri State. Um, you had gotten out of, uh, you know, playing and then you went into coaching. You coached for a couple of years in the St. Louis Cardinals organization. Man, just if if you would, just run me through a little bit of what the playing career was like and then the transition into the coaching career. Yeah, man. No, I, uh, I grew up in Toronto, just outside Toronto, Canada. So obviously, you know, I came down here as a big move in my life. Um but such a great opportunity, learned a ton. Um, I mean, ups and downs of my playing career at Missouri State as an individual, but also uh, on some teams I played on. I, you know, I, I had a great experience of playing on a, an under 500 team in, in 2014 and then turning around the next year and playing on the, the most winningest team in Missouri State history and hosting a regional and being one game from Omaha. So, um, you know, obviously my, my experiences here were unbelievable. Um, my passion for the game was at an all time high, got, got the opportunity to get drafted, which, you know, every player wants it was a dream come tr true for me drafted in a round that, that doesn't even exist anymore, which is hilarious. But, uh, no, I took on, you know, took on pro ball as a minor league player. Um, you know, wasn't a great player at all, but, uh, took a lot of pride in just being a good teammate. Um, you know, as you know, when you're in the minor leagues, man, like staffs are short. So I was coaching first base. I was doing whatever it took to just, you know, be a guy in the locker room, things like that. And I think that really got me motivated when I when I got released. I just wanted to coach. So, um, you know, got my foot in the door at St. Louis University, which was a great opportunity to get going. Uh, Division one went to a regional that year, which was uh, which was an amazing experience at Ole Miss. And then uh, got hired back to the Cardinals, where I where I started my professional career and was there for three years, and you know coached a ton of guys that are in the big leagues. And I, I tell a lot of people, man, there's there's no better coaching experience than than being able to be involved with with guys that are on the brink of playing at the highest level in the world. So I learned a ton about you know the mental side of the game, adjustments how to fine tune a swing and approach, you name it, you know, I was able to learn it. So, um, you know, that got me back here uh, just in summer 21. And, you know, our program was a little down, especially offensively. So it was time to, to build it back up. Obviously, this is where my heart is. So I was excited to get back and, you know, snap your fingers three years later. And, you know, I got a new title on the head coach and uh, things are a little different now. So um, excited to be where I'm at today, but just trying to be where my feet are at and keep building this program up. That uh, fires me up. Um, so obviously you guys are, but before we start getting into what's, what's going on moving forward, I just wanted to highlight, you know, some stuff, man, obviously you guys have been hitting the baseball, hitting the baseball, well, hitting the baseball a long way. You obviously have a hitting coach background. Um, how much does that play? Into, what's, what's the philosophy 
uh, when it comes to hitting the baseball at Missouri State. So uh, 2022, you guys had 110 home runs. 2023, you guys had 89 home runs. 2024, this year that just finished, currently still going on, 114 home runs. You guys ranked top 10 nationally, man. What is the secret behind that success? What are you teaching your hitters to be able to put this much damage into a regular season? Yeah, it all starts with simplicity here. Um, learned that when I was working with the Cardinals, Jeff Albert was the major league hitting coach. Russ Steinhorn was the hitting coordinator. Um, and our whole approach was literally just hit strikes hard. Um, so for us, I, I brought that to Missouri State um, in terms of a philosophy. But the day to day, man, we're always talking about how, how can we make your hit tool better? How can we make your plate discipline and zone awareness better? And how can we allow you to hit the ball harder? If you do those things and focus on those things, we kind of call it the meat and potatoes here. You do those things while you're going to score some runs. Then it's just about playing, you know, a little bit of small ball around it when you need it. And uh, you'll have a good offense. Um, as far as what we teach, man, we just try and get the most out of each guy's swing. That's the biggest thing. Understand, you know, how to raise their floor. That's a big thing we talk about here. Um, and then, you know, blow off the ceiling because we don't like to believe in ceilings here. Um, you can do anything at Missouri State in terms of a player. So why why cap yourself? Um, but yeah, the offensive success has been has been big here the last three years. And again, it's all about just keeping things simple and you know understanding there's a development piece with your swing, and then there's you know the competition piece and approach piece that matters equally as much. And and we put a lot of effort into both. I love it. Um, practice wise, so obviously, man, how do you practice hitting? You can grind off the tee. You can do front toss, flip. You can do a whole bunch of different drills and stuff, man. But um, specifically, I just wanted to focus on the hitting aspect of it because I don't have a, a pitching background. I know nothing about that stuff. Uh, I know I know some about hitting. I know some about playing some defense in the outfield. So I just wanted to ask you about the stuff that I necessarily knew, man. Um, how do you practice offensively? Uh, are you guys practicing to fail? Are you trying to make it challenging or is it a lot of feel good stuff, right? You want guy, you want your guys to feel sexy, right? You don't necessarily want them to fail. Um, some coaches have different philosophies, man. I, I, I was wondering what you guys do at Missouri State. Yeah, it's both for us. Um, and we really harp on that. So all our guys, all our hitters have an individual routine um, that consists of things outside the cage, right? Uh, movement prep, um, specific stretches to get ready to swing the bat. And then when they get in the cage, they'll have specific drill work, whether it be for their load, their lower half, their path, whatever it is, whatever they need, whatever the game's telling us about their swing, they'll have a routine off that. And that's where we, we try and hammer the feel good piece. Um, Cause again, I always tell our guys like, you know, you're the one that's got to get in the box and hit 95, not me. Right. So, you know, how can I make you feel comfortable in there? And, and number one, like if your swing feels good, that's a level of confidence that matters. So we put a lot of effort and, and work and adjustments into those routines. It's a big part of what we do here. Um, but then we also train pretty messy as well. We have an eye pitch here. So um, Jake Berger is one of our alums, big leaguer with the Marlins who who got that for us. So, I mean, we're we're training anything off of, you know, you're facing Verlander and Max Fried to, you know, you can prepare for the Friday night guy you're facing in, in the Missouri Valley Conference. So uh, that's where the decision making works comes in. Um, you know, I'm only 31. My arm's still attached, so I like to chuck some uh, some mixed BP as much as I can for these guys, and um, they dig that a lot. But for us, it's how how often can we practice hitting strikes in the middle of the plate and taking balls? And uh, you know, we do that every day as much as we can. And you know, I know the homers are a big thing here, but you know, we take a lot of pride in, in taking our walks as well. Um, I think in league play this year, we led led the uh, conference in walks. Um, we had a freshman that had 50 walks this year, which is a crazy feat. Um, so as much as we're talking about hitting the ball hard, we're talking about swinging at good pitches here, but you got to back it up and train it. And we do that a lot. Ah, it's fantastic. Um, so you had mentioned, you mentioned a couple things. There's a, there's two directions I want to go here. Obviously you mentioned your age. You are extremely young to be taken over the helm of a division one program. That is insane. That is amazing. Uh, I absolutely respect that. Are you the youngest Division One coach right now? Uh, I think so. Know? Okay. I think I think you know our SID brought that up the other day, um, but I kind of forgot about it. But yeah, I, I might be. That's amazing. How? 
how are you in this position? Um, obviously, like y- you have to, you have to prove it as you move up through the ladder. But um, man, I I wanted to kind of get into coaching. I wasn't a hundred percent sure how to get into it. Um, I didn't know where to go, what level to to kind of go go at, start at. I didn't know what my expertise was necessarily going to be. I always kind of dreamed of being a coach one day. I just didn't know what it would look like. So here I am now at the Nine Hole Podcast. If somebody wants to follow in your shoes and be a Division One head coach one day. Now, what would you recommend to them? What could they take from your career path in order to maybe, you know, expedite the process a little bit more, achieve their dreams quicker like you are? Yeah, no, I think for me, obviously, you know, I think this goes for anything in life, any job. A lot of it is just being at the right place at the right time. Um, and that's not me discounting what I've done to get here. Uh, it's just the reality of it. Um, obviously, when I got here, Coach Gutton, who's a legendary coach, was nearing the end of his career. Um, and I put myself in a position to to be the next head coach. But um, again, like I think experiences matter, whether you're, you know, you've had those experiences as an assistant coach until you're in your 40s or 50s and then you get your shot. Or, you know, if you're like myself or you're getting a head coaching shot early, um, what you've done leading up to this is going to be everything. And for me, I've always tried to step back and, and learn along the way. Um, you know, when I was in pro ball, I think when I took that job, I may have been 26 years old and I'm coaching some guys that are older than me. And uh, man, talk about you better be prepared when you get in that cage to work with a guy that's older than you that's trying to get into the big leagues. Um, Because if you're going to if he's going to trust you, you better you better understand what you're doing. Um, So just my experiences along the way have definitely prepared me for for this opportunity. but again, you know, for coaches that, that want to get there, I, I think the biggest thing is just have a vision. You know, I set out when I got into coaching, I knew that I wanted to be a head coach and I chased that every day. And I really just put my head down and worked. And the best piece of advice that I've ever gotten is just be where your feet are. Right. So if you want to, you know, if you're a, if you're an A ball hitting coach and you want to be in the big leagues, like you got to treat A ball like it's the big leagues, you know, and if you want to be. Um, a division one head coach and you're a division two assistant, like you got to work like you're a D one head coach. Um, And that's just the reality of it. If you spend too much time thinking about where you want to be, you're missing opportunities to, to grow as a coach and make players better and make your program better or whatever it might be. And I think that happens a lot in our industry because, you know, sometimes we take, we chase titles or locations or levels when really it comes down to just being good where you're at. And if you do that, things kind of take care of themselves. And that's kind of how things worked out for me. Oh, being good where you're at and becoming that person, right? Putting in that type of work. That's fantastic. Uh, we talk, I, I talk a lot on the show about becoming a 300 hitter. So when we talk about uh, wh- wherever we're at in the, in the season right now, let's say the majority of college baseball players, the majority of, I mean, all high school baseball players, their seasons are done, right? They're transitioning into summer ball the summer leagues, travel leagues, or you're playing collegiate summer ball, whatever that is, man. But let's say if if you were a 220 hitter this year for your school team, whatever level mm-hmm. that is at, and you wanted to be a 300 hitter, right? It's the way that I talk about it here is it's not necessarily a mechanic. That's mm-hmm. what I've experienced. It's more so like, are you putting in the work of a 300 hitter? Are you becoming a 300 hitter? Do you, um, you know, are you as disciplined and routine as a 300 hitter would be, right? It's not necessarily, hey, I hit 220. How do, how do I raise my batting average up 80 points? It's it's more so kind of like what you're saying, like um, be where your feet are, embrace the grass. Um, if you want to be a 300 hitter, like are you capable of hitting 300? Are you the type of player that can hit 300? So I just, I wanted to throw that in there, just kind of relating it to like what you're saying about, being a head coach, regardless of what level you're at, if you if you strive to be a division one head coach, like embracing the grass where you're at and acting and, and kind of performing, going about your business, uh, the process like a division one head coach. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I wanted to tie that in there, man. I just. Yeah. And, you know, I'll say something off of that, too. Like, you know, if you're hitting 220, you want to hit 300. You know, you can't focus on that. You're at 220. You know what I mean? Got to have a process and adjustments to get where you want to go. We had two good stories of that this year. So. Dylan Leach was a, a SEC transfer to our place this year, had one year left. Um, and I think at one point was hitting 050, uh, maybe 070, something like that. Um, and it was bad, man. Like it wasn't good. Um, but he dug himself out of a hole and, 
he ended up hitting just short of 300 with a thousand OPS, 16 home runs. And then Cody Kelly, uh, our first baseman, same thing. It was like, it was 050, 060. Like it was rough early on. I remember looking up at our jumbotron and it's like, man, I know those guys are seeing those numbers. That's not easy, but you know, just kept working, had a game plan before you know it, you're a couple hits away from being 150, a couple hits away from being 220. And uh, same thing, finished with over 1,000 OPS. I think he hit 13 or 14 home runs, and um, that's it, man. The finish line's always down the road. Don't don't get caught up in where you're at, you know, in early on or in the middle of the season. And I think, too, always going back to just compete, try and win the game when you're at bat. And, you know, you stack those days up, you know, before you know it, you're going to be where you want to be. Yeah. So the, having the game plan, digging themselves out of that early hole, right, it's it's – not necessarily how you start, right? People remember how you finish. Um, yeah. How were those two players? You, you had mentioned the game plan. So um, getting from that early season hole, digging out and finishing just below, right around, right above, right around 300. Is it a mechanic? Is it a mindset? You had said back when you when you're working with your hitters here at, at Missouri State, you had learned some things with your time at the Cardinals, man. At, is it more mindset driven or is it more mechanically driven? Obviously we have baseball data through the wazoo nowadays, man. Anything can be tracked, quantified, right? And you can use that to kind of, um, you know, craft an approach moving forward. Those two boys you just mentioned, were they able to turn it all around with a mindset or was it more like a mechanic and, um, you know, physical? So when we look at a hitter, we always kind of consider their, their process like a pie, right? So the mechanics, a piece of the pie, um, the approach is a piece of the pie. Um, their their mentality when they show up to the yard, piece of the pie. Their routine, piece of the pie. So for those guys, it was it was for sure giving them a concrete, a more concrete routine. I think a lot of guys when they struggle, they're trying something new each day. So just hey, this is what you're gonna do every day, and you're gonna die on this hill. And if you fail, I'm in there with you. Um, I think that helps. It gives some players some trust. Um, they don't feel like it's just them in there. Um, you know, specifically with Dylan Leach, I remember for his, his main issue, and this is obviously like, you know, where analytics help you, you know, like the chase down was really bad. That's where he's getting burned early in counts. So we just really shifted his sights as a hitter, shifted his approach in terms of where he was looking in the zone. Before you know it, he started laying off those pitches early, getting in count leverage, and then doing some damage. That's how you can flip your stuff around. I think a lot of times we're trying to swing our way out of things. And if you just have a good plan, it'll eventually come to you if you stay with it. So just giving just giving hitters something concrete to do in the cage and something concrete to go to the plate with helps a lot. I encourage all hitting coaches to to do that. I think it's good because if you give players some structure, um, you know, before you know it, they're going to have some confidence and then they get just a little bit of results. You know, you got them and they're going to they're going to be rolling. Love it. I love it. I love it. So when we talk about Missouri State baseball um, and, and the Missouri Valley Conference, man, obviously there is some some top talent. There's some top baseball being played in your conference, man. What sets your team apart from the competition? What sets your team apart from all of the other teams in the Missouri Valley Conference? Why would um, maybe a transfer player or a high school player want to step on campus and play for you? Yeah, no, I'm locked in on this speech right now because I've been doing it for the last two weeks with uh, some transfers. But uh, no, nah, man, the biggest thing is you can't buy history and tradition and we have it. Right. So, you know, we have 23 major league players here, which is incredible. Um, I think just I, I think 19 of them have been since 2000, you know, so you're, you're almost pumping out a major league player every year. Uh, we've had six first round picks, which is incredible. Uh, we kicked down the door to Omaha in 03. We hosted a regional in 15. We've played in two supers since 15 as well. Um, so what I always tell players is you can do anything you want here as a player in terms of winning and in terms of individual success. All-American players of the year, first rounders. I mean, Ryan Howard played here. Guy's a National League MVP, National League Rookie of the Year, Silver Slugger, made over $200 million in his career. You can do anything you want here. So that's the biggest thing. We're not we're not selling a pipe dream. You know, we're selling something that we're, we've done and we're just looking to do it again. And we're, we're asking players to join us on on that journey. Um, that's so that's more broad scope kind of Missouri State baseball. But in the now, I mean, 
you just heard me talk about how detailed we are with our hitters. You know, that's how it is in this program. It's super individualized. We only get a 30 man roster here. So everyone else in D1 baseball has the luxury to go to 40. We only get 30. Why is so, that? Uh, it's a title nine title nine topic. So it, it has to do with uh, number of female students and female student athletes on campus. And, and those numbers need to match. So um, basically we just get docked roster spots. So does our soccer team. So does our football team. So we get 30, um, you know, can it be a disadvantage? Sure. But for us, it's definitely an advantage in terms of development. You know, there's way more attention on our players. There's an individual approach. There's a plan for all these guys. And for me, that's the separator. You know, you have a coaching staff that understands, um, you know, the little things of the game, the mindset, um, approaches, the day to day. But you also have a coaching staff that that's modern and understands analytic analytics at a really high level. And uh, for us, that's what's been really good for our development. Um, you know, our draft history obviously speaks for itself and something we take a lot of pride in here. We want guys to come here because they want to succeed. And, you know, we want to get them out on, on the other end of playing professional baseball. That makes a ton of sense. I appreciate you elaborating on that, man. That is that is fantastic right there. Um, let's let's talk about so you obviously just took over the program. Let's talk about moving forward, man. So um, you spent some time as the associate head coach, hitting coach. You, you did some recruiting, man. Um, what what is the focus now as you take over and you're moving into the offseason? Right. What is what is the focus? Um, you know, the day to day stuff that that you are going into. Um, man, what are the goals that you're trying to accomplish this offseason? I mean, I think the biggest thing is you kind of need to lay a foundation in the summer. You know, we have uh, 12 players here training all summer. That's a good opportunity for them to get after it, uh, continue to develop and kind of lay a foundation for what next year's club's going to be. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer, like each team has its own identity. Obviously, you have you're going to have a program identity. That's great. But you know, the best thing about Missouri State Baseball is that you get to be yourself. And it's always been that way, and it'll continue to be that way. And and that's what we're trying to create here going into next year is what this what does this team's identity need to be? You know, I think I counted over over eight teams in regionals this year that maybe didn't have the season they wanted last year. Right. So I always tell our guys, you never know how close you are to making a run in this game. You never know how close you are to being a draft pick. You never know how close you are to the big leagues. Right. And it goes back to just being where our feet are. So for us, it's making the the adjustments that, that need to be made. And that starts with me at the top. Um, but also just, you know, new era, like you said, you know, bring a little juice, bring a little energy, get this thing going in the next year. It's our last year in the Missouri Valley. So we're switching over to Conference USA in 26. So, um, you know, we're trying to gain a little momentum before we do that and have a big year this next year. Love it. Love it. Love it. That is awesome. Um Man, what are the challenges of being, let's say you were an assistant coach, associate head coach. Obviously, you were striving to become the head coach and you have achieved that goal. What were the challenges of being um, maybe that assistant coach, the the hitting coach, the associate head coach? Uh, what, what were the challenges and, and kind of the trials and tribulations, the adversities that you had you had gone through and dealt with with those job titles, with those positions? Yeah, you know, when I came here uh, after the 21, so I came here in the summer of 21 after that college season and uh, offensively, the program wasn't in a great spot. And, um, you know, that was obviously a challenge. And, and a big piece of it was, you know, implementing a system that players are going to trust. Um, that was a huge responsibility getting here. You know, you take on 15 new hitters. Um, you know, how are you going to gain their trust? How are you going to build their confidence? Why should they listen to you when you have a, a opinion on a swing adjustment or an approach? You got to put in the work, man. That was a huge challenge for me. And I was probably one of my most proud coaching moments was um, was taking that group of players. I mean, we really we had a, a couple transfers, but I think we returned seven guys in the lineup. And uh, overall that year, we improved, improved OPS is, I think, over 230 points or something like that and proved batting average slug on base percentage and it meant a lot to me because those kids, you know, bought into what we were trying to do. And a lot of them, they got to go to a regional for the first time, which was really cool. Um, and being able to watch that was amazing. And then we had some draft picks. You know, our catcher was a third rounder that year, knocking on the door to the big leagues in AAA right now. So 
that was that was really cool. And and I think now as I switch over the head coaching seat, it's just continuing to empower empower our assistants. That's why they're here. They got a job to do. I'm not a micromanage guy. It's let's set it, let's set a plan and let's go attack it as coaches. So I'm really looking forward to that part. Obviously, you know, still a couple months away before we get the guys back and we start fall practice, but that's going to be a lot of fun for me. So we we talk about leadership a lot on this podcast with the dynamic of a baseball team and just from top to bottom, leadership obviously starts up top. Um, you know, once the manager or the head coach of a baseball team loses the respect of the players, you lose the locker room, the team crumbles, man. I, it's It's crazy to think about nowadays players if they face some sort of adversity they can transfer right mm -hmm. whether whether the situation isn't great uh or things aren't coming easy or playing time isn't necessarily in abundance in a certain spot they might be able to pack up and move elsewhere man what do you got on the transfer portal nowadays i'm thinking about my time back at wagner man i was a the reason why the nine hole podcast got started i was a walk-on in college wagner college staten island new york ended up getting drafted, ended up making it to the big league. So I started the Nine Hole Podcast because I wanted to show the next generation of players that, man, even though you're a walk-on or you're a Nine Hole hitter or you're not a full-ride dude, um, you know, in the Missouri Valley Conference, right, you don't have the, the greatest opportunities like anything is possible. Man, what yeah. do you got on the transfer portal nowadays? I'm grateful that I ended up grinding it out at Wagner College. It taught me a lot. I don't think that I would have been able to swim in minor league baseball. It definitely would have sank had I transferred away from my problems. Obviously, it's a little different back then because I would have had to sit out if I wanted to transfer to another Division One. But the transfer portal obviously plays a huge role in how managers and organizations can, you know, build their lineup, build their team. And um, when it comes to recruiting, when it comes to getting players into Missouri State. How big of a factor does the transfer portal play into how you go about your business and, and getting players on campus? Yeah, no, I, I think um, the transfer portal has a little bit of a negative image. Um, and I think in large part to some people just are focusing on the wrong things. And don't get me wrong, there's some things about it that I don't love. Um, but I do, you know, like you loved your situation at Wagner. I loved my situation at Missouri State. But I always remember, like, not every kid's situation is like that. And there's going to be scenarios where kids want to get out. So, you know, I'm for it for that. Um, you know, these these kids, they only get a four year window to do this thing. Um, so for me, if, if there's a kid that's not in an ideal situation, I do think there's a there's a luxury to that for that kid. Um, I don't love that you can transfer every year now. Um, I, I was for the, you know, the one time transfer. Here's your shot to find a new home that you need now that you've experienced college a little bit. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing, like for us, we're a great landing spot for if you played in the power five and maybe you didn't, you, you're talented enough to be there, but you didn't get the playing time. We're a good spot. Right. We had uh, two SEC transfers play every day for us last year. One of them was our catcher that I talked about earlier. Um, but we're also a good spot too. Like if you're playing Division two ball and you want to get a crack at D1, um, we're a good spot, right? Our shortstop was a Division two player, um, played every single day for us, um, grinder, uh, and wanted to crack at D1, right? So that I'm for that. But I always bring this up when people talk about the transfer portal. The grass ain't always greener on the other side. And that goes for the players, but that also goes for teams too. So there's teams that are out there right now. They're, you know, they're trying to build a team through the portal. That's fine. That's your choice. But that doesn't mean, you know, the grass is going to be greener and you're going to get everything you want. Right. I still I still take a lot of pride in high school recruiting here. Um, if you look at our last three years since I've been here, we've played freshmen every single year. We've just had our third straight freshman All-American. Um it matters to me. And I think that's how you build. Now you got to do a good job. And it's the landscape of the business of, of, you know, having good relationships with these players and making them want to stay at Missouri State. But that's part of coaching, man. It's about relationships. And for us, we're never going to build our roster through the portal. Are we going to add some guys here and there? For sure. That's part of it. You know, are we going to part ways with some players? Because maybe we feel like it's a better opportunity for them to go get more playing time. Yeah, we're always going to be honest with guys. So that's where I think it can be a positive, but again, it's it's not the grass ain't always greener on the other side, and and you have to have a good balance and a good plan as a coach when you're attacking this thing. 
could not agree more with everything you're saying. Fires me up. I love it. Thank you for answering those questions. This uh, last couple questions I got for you, man, this is strictly advice to the next generation. So let's say, Joey, if, if players want to be, um, you know, suited up in Missouri State gear one day, they want to be playing at the Division One level for you, for your program, um, man, what kind of advice would you get them regarding being seen by you? So let's say you or somebody from your staff are going out and watching a tournament or watching a specific player. Now, what are the kinds of things that a player can do on and off the field that you might be watching or looking at that they could do to stand out? Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, the, the biggest thing that I always start with is, and and this might sound like not the best advice, but like you got to be good enough, right? Like you got to be good enough to play D1 baseball. You got to be a good player to play at Missouri State. So number one is like you got to have skills. And for us, when we recruit high school kids, we follow them like very closely. So what I mean by that is like we're going to watch you play a lot of games before we probably offer you. Right. So you got to be a performer, man. Like you got to perform at the level you're at. You got to if you're a pitcher, you got to get out. You got to do your thing. Um, if you're a hitter, you got to rake. Like, that's what we want. But the the thing that's more controllable is, like, your work ethic and attitude, we're going to find out about it, right? So that might not show up if we go watch your travel ball game, right? But we're going to find out. We're going to call the right people. We're going to figure out what your character is because we only have a 30-man locker room, right? So you bring a couple bad apples in there, and it's not good for our club. So that's kind of how we go about it. Um, again, we're trying to find the right fit. You know, for us, it's – you got to be a little bit of a different guy to play at Missouri State. You know, you have to have an, a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. You got to have an edge, and it's a blue collar, hard working program. You got to be a guy that can that can do those things. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing too, when I talk about skill and us watching you for a long time, like, do you have the ability to develop and get better, right? So if we watch you when you're 16, and then we turn around and watch you when you're 17, and you've stayed the same, that's a little bit of a red flag for us. But if you show that you have continued to improve in areas, then we know that we're going to be able to do that at a maybe a higher level here. Love it. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's beautiful right there. So you are kind of diving into more so, obviously, like you have to be talented to play at, at Missouri State. You have to be talented to play at the Division One level. But you are doing your due diligence on stuff off the field, too. The character, the work ethic, how they go about their business, how, they, how they're being a good teammate. Man, in today's game, right, it's like, how, how do you stand out? Um, you know, everybody, it, man, the game's flashy now. It's played with emotion. There's nothing There's nothing bad about that, man. I'm not trashing that. But, like, how do you stand out? How do you really separate from a world of flash? I had Jason Kipnis on the podcast last week, man. He was talking about uh, being an everyday Eddie, being the type of dude that can be relied on, accountable, the type of dude that your manager or, you know, your head coach can can write his name in pen in the lineup every day. They have an idea of what they're going to get out of you. Um, and they can just count on you. Uh, not necessarily making the the top 10 sports center flashiest plays and getting the most likes and clicks, but like, man, being fundamentally sound, being a good teammate, having good character, the stuff that you're saying, man, it's it's awesome. Wanted to highlight it because I think it, it goes hand in hand kind of with what Kit was saying. Like, man, he, he wasn't Dude, he was he wasn't necessarily the flashiest player playing the flashiest position, right? He's a second baseman, two-time all-star, played for 10 years, made a whole bunch of money, influenced a whole bunch of wins, right? And it's like, man, how how can you stand out and have longevity in the game of baseball? Being that type of player, man, going about your business the right way. Uh absolutely beautiful. I love it, man. So what would be an immediate red flag, Joey? Let's say if you came out and you watched me play, man. Let's I'm going to ask you about what the process is here is probably one of my last questions to you. But let's say you came out and you watch me play. You're like, hey, this Ian Miller dude, we've seen a little bit of video. We've heard a little bit of buzz. I'm going to come out and I'm going to watch him play. What would be a, a, some red flags on if you came to watch me play? You're like, this guy cannot play baseball for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we have our parameters on the on the hitting side of what we're looking at. You know, it goes back to our hitting philosophy. We like guys that you know, can can manage the strike zone. That's a big one. You know, if you're not managing the strike zone well in high school, it's probably going to be tough for you at our level. Um, you know, we, we don't obsess over like exit velocity and stuff. If you can do it at a young age, great. We're probably going to make it better. But then it's for us, our job to figure out if we think you're going to do it regardless of, of when you're here. Um, and then on the pitching side for us, 
Um, you know, we don't, we're not obsessed with Velo. We like, we like good movers on the mound. We like guys that can spin the ball for strikes. Um, but man, on the, on the mound, we like dogs. Like we like guys that compete and they can win a ball game. And we've really tried to look at that a little bit more recently. Uh, we think that matters when you get to this level. Um, so those are things, that's just kind of how we go about evaluation. But as far as red flags, I mean, look, we show up to the ballpark, we see everything. You know what I mean? I, I don't, I don't love kids like talking trash to other teams. And I don't love guys that are barking at umpires. Like I get it. This is an emotional game and stuff, but I like guys that can kind of keep things in check and be on their guys and, and be a good teammate. And, you know, you try, you try and watch that when you're at the game. Um, but I think the biggest thing, man, if you got skill, like don't do something stupid on the field, that's going to make someone get off of you in terms of their interests, right? Just go play the game hard. Um, you know, try and win, be a performer, be a good teammate. And I think a lot takes care of itself in this game. And there's so many places to play division one baseball, division two baseball, Juco. There's a place for everyone out there. And I, that's why I always encourage kids like go do your thing on the field and you will find the right fit if you want to do this thing. Love it. Love it. Love it. And so with that, um, how would I get seen by you? So there's obviously different, there's different processes, processes. I, you know, the, the plural word of that, I don't even want to mess it up. There's a different process for every school, right? Uh, the, every program, man, how would I get seen by you? So would it be like, what is the best way to go about it? Is there a recruiting questionnaire on your website? I go to Missouri state baseball, fill it out, send some video over, maybe send an email and then come to a camp send you the scheduling like what what is the best way uh to make that go about to get seen by you yeah you know we usually start obviously we go out we're at the big events we're we're sifting through names it's it's nice having a third assistant at this level now too so you can get extra eyes on people um so you know we'll always start building our list that way um we tend to have smaller high school recruiting classes um with our roster size um, in terms of reaching out to us, you know, we have a, we have an email, baseball at Missouri state.edu, um, send anything over schedules, videos. Um, but the biggest thing is if you go to a camp, if you go to a division one camp, right. And you're invited to it personally invited. I think that holds some weight because I think that coaching staff's trying to get a closer look at you, right. Right, right on their field with the whole staff. So I think that matters if you can do those things, you know, don't break the bank. You don't have to go to a million of them, but highlight some schools you like, try and get in touch with the coaching staff or have a, have one of your coaches reach out to the coaching staff on your behalf. I think it's a great way to get seen. Um, I would say on our roster right now, we probably have seven guys that attended prospect camps and ended up coming here. So that's how we do it. I mean, again, it's it's an opportunity for us to see them closer, an opportunity for the player to see who we are, how we interact, and what our facilities are all about here. Yes, makes a ton of sense. Joey, thank you so much for your time. Last question I got for you. Obviously, the College World Series is about to get underway. Man, who do you got winning it all this year, you think? I don't know. I think that uh, that first, what, Friday night game, Florida State versus Tennessee is going to gonna tell us a lot. Those are two yeah. good clubs. Um, I've gotten up to know uh, Tony Vitello a little bit over the years, have a good relationship with him. So pulling for him, but yeah, it's a good field this year. And uh, there's some teams that can absolutely bang. So I think it should be an exciting uh, couple weeks in Omaha. And, you know, hopefully we uh, kick down the door and get back there here soon. Yes, I, I love that. I love it. Joey, thank you so much for your time coming on here. Letting me ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, about your career, about your journey, about Missouri State baseball, man. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we look forward to watching the continued success as you continue making a splash in the college baseball world. Joey, thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in again to the Nine Hole Podcast. We will catch you back here again later today with ex-Major League catcher Nick Dini. Take care, guys. Joey, thank you, man.